and welcome to the second vlog of Old North State Politics. I'm Michael Bitzer of Catawba College. In today's episode, we're talking candidates, conventions, and campaigning, all in the age of COVID. And I am joined by my distinguished colleagues and good friends, Dr. Susan Roberts, Professor of Political Science at Davidson College, Dr. Whitney Ross Manzo, Associate Professor of Political Science at Meredith College, and Dr. Chris Cooper, Professor of Political Science at Western Carolina University. And we had such great reaction. And I want to first off thank everybody who watched the first episode. I know it's been about a month. Uh, we have had an insane summer. I think I can speak for all four of us in terms of trying to get ready for the semesters that we're all starting either this week or next week or shortly thereafter. But uh, the reaction was very positive. And I would like to thank everybody who watched and listened. And hopefully, you'll get some more good information out of this one. And we'll keep doing it uh, throughout the fall campaign season. But I want to start off with just talking about the candidates and the big news of the week. Although I probably should say we're taping this uh, Thursday, August 13th in the afternoon. Who knows what new big news will hit after we uh, post this. But really, the big news of the week, Joe Biden and the announcement of Senator Kamala Harris of California as his running mate. I want to get everybody's reactions and thoughts about the pick, um, but I want to start with Whitney first and mention that you're a panelist uh, this coming Tuesday, August 18th, for the 2020 Status of Women in North Carolina report. I'm curious as to how you see the Harris uh, selection. We knew that Biden was going to be picking uh, a woman for the vice presidential uh, nomination slot, but how do you see this playing out and how does this might tie into your report that you're going to be presenting next week? Well, uh, just to be clear, I didn't help write the report. That was done by uh, the NC Council for Women, um, but they asked me to be a panelist to talk about some of the research that I've done on women in North Carolina politics both on my own uh, with David McLennan and um, through the Meredith poll. And so what we have found it, um, in general is that representation of women in North Carolina has decreased slightly um, over the last few years. Uh, women are voting well, but that's pretty much the extent of the um, participation for many women in the state. Uh, and I think that Kamala Harris being on the ticket um, may help that because uh, a lot of women thought that, um, particularly Democratic women, thought that uh, Hillary Clinton was treated unfairly in 2016. There was a lot of sexism in the campaign. And so a lot of women in the Democratic Party especially um, thought that there should be another woman on the ticket for sure and were reassured when Joe Biden said he would pick a woman Kamala in particular is important as a woman of color uh, because as we all know, um, black women are some of the strongest stalwarts of the Democratic Party, but uh, Kamala is also half South Asian. And um, that is uh, one of the fastest growing minority groups in the state of North Carolina. And so I think that her nomination could also um, inspire that group to turn out as well. Interesting. Susan, what, how do you see it playing out in terms of the selection of Senator Harris and, and the potential here in North Carolina for generating enthusiasm, turnout, uh, particularly among women. Sure, and I want to reiterate and echo a lot of um, what Whitney said, and especially about um, African American women and also people of color with the Latin, Latino community growing so that I think that's a nice distinction that lets everybody in on, um, on the game. Just when you started to think that the South in, in, in general was getting uh, more liberal, a little less uh, you know, conservative, a tiny bit more progressive, along comes Georgia and uh, the QAnon candidate uh, who won the Republican primary. And, and that still gives you pause about um, uh, how we're going to vote. I haven't seen the breakdown of who voted uh, in that election, uh, male or female. But I do think in North Carolina in particular, if President Trump continues to characterize Kamala Harris in the way that he is with the trope 
um, angry, nasty. If you put what Jonathan Capehart once said, if you put those words, angry and suburban and Midwestern and middle class through a political and kind of cultural decoder, they come up white. And I think when you say angry, that's been really widely recognized as something that is highly racist. And I just don't know how much we can play the race card in North Carolina. I think North Carolina is in a kind of middle ground right now in terms of not wanting to return to some of the, um, uh, the sexist, homophobic um, uh, activities that have been going on in terms of measures that the state legislature has seemed to pass and that would be detrimental to women in North Carolina, African-American women. And I want to point out too that I think we heard on the newscast, and that is um, North Carolina has the largest number of um, students enrolled from historically black colleges and universities. And there was a lot of excitement on the national news about that. And I think that's going to carry um, uh, and maybe in, in, you know, really energize a lot of African-American women um, and uh, sororities and just women who said, this is somebody that I can identify with in North Carolina, as well as uh, given that student enrollment, the youth vote. Yeah, that, I, that's going to be an interesting uh, venue to watch through. Chris, what do you see as, as some of the uh, components of the Harris selection for here in North Carolina? Yeah, I mean, I think really smart points from, from Susie and Whitney, of course, and just I think Whitney's points at the beginning, too, about just the importance of, of female representation in North Carolina politics and where that fits is critical as we talk about this selection or about representation more generally. Um, as far as the Harris pick, I mean, clearly it's, it's the one we saw coming in some ways. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about her gender, which is clearly key. Joe Biden had said that he was going to select a woman. That was, of course, not a surprise. But um, Harris has experience. She's been tested on the national stage, which you don't want as a surprise, right? You don't want another Sarah Palin who the world learns about in real time as they are your vice presidential candidate. So I think Harris was a smart pick, a natural pick in a whole lot of ways. The conventional wisdom in political science, of course, is that vice presidential candidates don't matter very much, with Sarah Palin as being the exception. So there was a really nice piece today in uh, the Monkey Cage, a, a blog on the Washington Post website, folks may know. If you don't, you should definitely go visit it, about kind of summarizing the political science literature that says, eh, Vice presidential candidates may be important, but they're not the difference maker. I tend to think this one may be a little different, yeah. um, partially because, of course, of, of, of Harris's race and experience, and partially, frankly, because of, of Joe Biden's age. I think because of his age, the choice of vice president is a more salient consideration for most folks than it would be otherwise. That's a good point. Susan, let me pick up and, and Whitney also. How, do you see this selection of, of Harris as, as a consequential potential uh, deciding factor when, when we are heading into this election? Susan, I want to start with you. Well, I sure do. And I didn't see the monkey cage um, post today, but um, the literature is out there about a vice presidential uh, selection is not being, it might be a little bump, but it fades. But I think we have to look at these relative to the candidate. And I think Harris as a VP choice is really going to help Biden. And, and one of the things people said, and I just have to, to put this in, because I thought I had a friend that really was not a Harris supporter, but I said, you know, I've been hearing on the news, he picked someone, a man of his era, picked someone who was younger, uh, different race, spunkier, who will um, push him and hold him accountable. And sometimes, you know, that's not something that a man born in the, you know, the 30s or the 40s might do. And, and he did that. And I think that's very important to look at in terms of, as, as Chris said, offsetting not only his physical age, but the kind of era that he comes from. And, and that is more the, and we'll get into the suburban housewives later. <laughs> well, Whitney, you want to talk about suburban housewives? <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say, I do think the Harris pick is different uh, than vice presidential choices in the past. Uh, but I also um, still believe that at the end of the day, this election is going to come down to more people being enthusiastic about voting Trump out than voting Biden in. Um, the Republicans have made a lot of uh, 
hay out of the fact that Biden voters are less enthusiastic than Trump voters report being. Um, but I, I think that that's obfuscation of the fact that sure, they might not be excited about Biden, but they're very excited about voting Trump out. Right. And so uh, Kamala Harris might help with the enthusiasm for Biden, you know, now she might make people want to vote for him more. But I, again, I still think that this will ultimately come down to passionate Trump voters and passionate anti-Trump voters. So, so basically a referendum election, I mean, which is kind of the classic, any presidential incumbent seeking re-election, you know, how have you done over the past four years versus what are you gonna do in the next four years kind of an approach. Okay. And even bigger than from 2018, a bigger referendum, because Trump, um, by all accounts, is getting more and more unpredictable. And people don't like to be in a situation uh, where things are uncertain. We usually take the, you know, I always say we lose a lot of political science majors because we start with the Constitution. Now, I think we'll get majors if we start with the Constitution. Excellent. So, Speaking of predictability versus unpredictability, we've got the political conventions coming up. Uh, the DNC starts next week. We've got our ticket that will be formally nominated and accept the, the uh, nominations. And then, and they're doing it virtually. They're, they're doing it in kind of a, a new tack, uh, dealing with COVID. And then we've got the RNC the week after, which part of it will be in Charlotte, part of it will be somewhere as yet to be determined. Um, I'm curious, Chris, you know, how, how do you see the role of national conventions nowadays? I mean, what's their purpose? And, you know, as, as a follow-up, could we be seeing the last of the in-person political conventions with this year? You know, I don't know that we're seeing the last of the in-person, but I mean, clearly this is a cheerleading event for each party, right? And both parties do this. They both expect to see small bumps that come out of the convention. Neither party expects to see those um, bumps kind of hold. So really they're more of a bounce, if you will, than a bump. They come back down after, you know, a couple of weeks after the, uh, the conventions take place. I mean, there is party business that has to happen there as well. And I think sometimes we're so focused on the presidential nominating process that we forget about things like party platforms. We forget about the business of doing politics and, and actually building a party and maintaining a party. But look, the thing that's going to get the highlight, obviously, is the speakers, who's there. And I think it's also an opportunity to show who the party is going to be in the future. Right. When did we first hear about Barack Obama for the first time when he was, you know, very not very well known at all. And he gave a rousing speech yeah. at the Democratic National Convention. And all of a sudden, folks started talking about Barack Obama as a potential national player. So it's about the boring business of, of keeping a party going. It's about getting people fired up for your candidate and at least getting a small bounce, maybe a bump. And then I think the third, it's about saying, here's our vision for the future. And this is our farm team for the future. Whitney, what do you see as, as the need for both parties to try and accomplish in this virtual uh, convention scenarios that we're running into over the next two weeks? Well, uh, first, I want to say that I don't think that conventions are going to go anywhere. Um, as I, I went to both of the 2016 conventions, mm -hmm. and uh, there's the party business that's conducted, but it's also a time for um, co-partisans to have a giant party together and everyone loves a good time. Um, there's a lot of concerts that take place, a lot of celebrities show up. And so, I mean, there's just a palpable excitement in the air when you're walking around town. And um, I've told you all before, but I literally ran into Bernie Sanders, you know? And so like, that's a, it's an exciting thing. You know, you're looking around every corner for who you might see. And you know, the party faithful love that. They really enjoy getting together and you know, talk, cause this is their life. You know, if you're going to a convention, politics is your jam. And so I don't think the in-person party are, are gonna go anywhere just because everybody enjoys that atmosphere. Um, as far as what they need to accomplish virtually, that, that's actually exactly why this is gonna be a really challenging year because part of the point of the convention for the party faithful is to jazz them up to want to go back to their communities and turn out the vote. And so trying to accomplish that virtually is obviously much harder. 
Uh, and so they'll have to think about creative ways to encourage um, people to want to be at home. Well, and turning out the vote is also hard in a pandemic. Yeah. So th there's just all kinds of engagement um, issues that they're going to have to deal with. Uh, but as Chris said, political science research has shown that the impact on the average American voter of a convention is very slight. Um, I, point, I, I agree with um, um, Chris and Whitney, and I think Michael as well, that you know, they've become these choreographed um, infomercials that we've talked about, designed to maybe showcase some other candidates, as well as fuel the enthusiasm. But I remember in 2016, um, I felt a little bit better because I thought, oh gosh, what is a contested convention? What is a brokered convention? We need to go rush and see what, and that was one that had a lot of import. And um, not that we're going to see that soon, but I remember looking around in the cameras and they would pan to Ted Cruz and then they would pan to Bernie Sanders to see the kind of look on the face when um, the Republican nominees and the Democratic nominee uh, came forward. So I think they are kind of spectacle We've been watching television a lot during COVID-19. We're going to continue to watch, or we're we going to now we have all the channels. And um, I think there'll be some interest in um, in Trump uh, because of Trump. But he can't, you know, he wants to feed off that crowd, and he's not going to have that, or at least, well, never say never. This is true, and if if we've learned anything about 2020, it's definitely keep that at at, at the forefront. Um, speaking of never say never and uh, some things that we haven't seen before. Uh, we're continuing to see record requests here in North Carolina for absentee by mail ballots. Uh, it could be related to COVID, it could be related to campaign strategies, could be just pure voter interest uh, and enthusiasm. Uh, any thoughts in, in general in terms of how campaigns, how candidates are going to be impacted this fall and particularly with the election by the coronavirus and, and COVID-19? Susan, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, I had thought um, earlier on that given um, COVID-19, that nasty campaigning would be a little bit unseemly. Asking for money would be a little unseemly um, as things worsened, um, especially for uh, people who had uh, couldn't work at home. I think we're going to see more attempts to, you know, generate some money, but also we're going to see the nasty campaigns. When you look sometimes at the commercials that Trump is putting out in North Carolina, and those are the only ones I have, have seen. I've not looked at some of the other sources that will show you what ads are on everywhere. Um, some of his ads are ones that I would have thought, I look at the ticker, and they're not run by super PACs. They're run by Donald Trump. So I think um, the COVID-19 uh, campaigning is not going to be any less nasty than it has in the past. And um, I think, you know, what you're doing and, and everyone else in tracking those absentee ballots is essential because what is it going to mean? And you said, uh, we'll track through the fall season. That's only if you think <laughs> that things won't try, go on until December or oh, winter please. season. <laughs> we, we don't need a repeat of, 20, to, of 2000, please, if, if at all possible. <laughs> Uh, Chris, how do you see these, this COVID-19 impacting the campaign? You know, in all sorts of different ways. So, you know, obviously the vote by mail thing. And, and, and look, I think it's all of those things you talked about. I think it is likely voter interest. I think it is, you know, fear, frankly, of, of going to the polling place during a time of COVID-19. And it's also both parties um, making this a salient issue. I think Donald Trump, frankly, has not done himself any favors by raising the idea of vote by mail, even though he's trying to, to discount it. I think it is ultimately keeping it in the conversation. And I'd always kind of thought if this one thing that Donald Trump's really good at, it was steering the conversation towards topics he liked. This appears to, to not be a good example of that. So how's that going to play out? We don't know, but I'm watching, you know, what is the return rate like on these? So about 86%, uh, as we've talked about some, Michael, uh, of folks who requested ballots in 2016 returned them by mail in, uh, uh, in 2016. I want to see, does that number go up or down? Are these new voters or are these folks that are just voting in a different way? 
And so what does that mean for strategy? Well, if they do start returning them at about the same rates, it means that we may front load the general election even more. We've talked a lot about front loading, meaning moving earlier the primary season. Maybe we're gonna front load the general election season. And then kind of last thing is that I think, yes, this matters for presidential strategy, but I think it matters even more, COVID-19 matters even more down ballot, right? So look, the reality is I, I've never met Donald Trump. I doubt y'all have met Donald Trump. We don't spend a lot of time with presidential candidates. They campaign through the airwaves. They campaign through mailers, things you can still do. If you're a general assembly candidate in North Carolina, if you are a county commission candidate, you're not running ads. You're not getting YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. You're not expending the same amount of money, but yet you can't press the flesh. So I think it may have the biggest effect down ballot. Whitney, you're, you're our resident expert on public opinion, uh, assistant directing the, the Meredith poll. How do you see COVID playing out with public opinion and how voters are thinking about things in terms of uh, the election coming up? Well, the last time that we polled on uh, mail-in voting, the uh, majority of respondents said that they doubted, that they had questions about how accurate the results might be. Mm. Uh, which I think is a direct result of um, President Trump raising that specter. Uh, but I will think, I would guess that we would get slightly different responses now because uh, like Chris said, Trump is not doing himself any favors by continuously attacking mail-in voting. And like, just for example, um, earlier this morning, he said that he was withholding funding for the post office in order to prevent mail-in voting. That kind of thing is blowing up Twitter with everyone being, you know, even Republicans saying this is an outrageous wow. claim for the sitting president to make, literally saying election fraud out loud. So um, I, I think that we might see a shift in uh, respondents favoring mail-in voting because um, it it has been so attacked. And, and I'll just add... Um, the only piece of mail that I received in my household today, urgent notice from the Republican Party of North Carolina about an absentee by mail voting. <laughs> Susan got one as well. So I'm not saying there's, there's correlation between not getting any other mail, which is fine. I don't need any more bills and this, but we'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, Michael, can I, can yeah. I turn the table Please. on you for just once? This is off script for anybody who's watching. Michael does not know I'm going to do this. What yeah. are people missing on vote by mail that you've seen that, that isn't getting talked about thus far? The biggest thing that, that I have been asked continuously is, can I trust, if I get my absentee by mail ballot and I've got it in my hands, can I trust that it's going to get returned and accepted? And, you know, I always talk about, you know, make sure you follow the instructions. It's like with our students, read the syllabus, read the, the requirements. You have to sign things. You have to have a witness uh, and then mail it back. Or, and, and people I think are very much astonished that you can do this. If you get an absentee by mail ballot, you can physically take it to your county board of elections office, or when early voting starts, you can go to one of the early voting sites and drop it off. Now, the question I have that, that we're still trying to wrestle with is, how is that going to, how are people going to physically do that with the crush of what we expect to be voters wanting to vote in person? You know, I have to think, Voting by mail is probably the most convenient form because you get your ballot and you can sit down and look at the candidates and go to their websites and maybe see what some of the issues are about for state house, state senate, county commission, you know, these kinds of things. Have the ballot in front of you, see the candidates' names and do some research and then make educated voting choices. Um, I, I think that, that that is always a mantra that I've been singing to the high heavens over the past couple of weeks. And every time I do it, it's like, 
oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, okay, so we can hand deliver it. Yes, yes. So that, that I think, is going to be the interesting thing to kind of watch it play out over, over the next couple of weeks, uh, particularly when early voting starts on October 15th in this state. Um, we've got some analyses on the blog site that, that we're all contributing to. Uh, we've had a piece on the 7 million registered voters here in North Carolina, kind of deep dive demographically into that. Uh, Chris has done a piece on the state Senate districts, and we're going to have one on state house, and then everybody's got uh, some congressional districts. But speaking of congressional districts in the news this week, uh, Chris, we had some interesting news out of the 11th, which is the, the mountains uh, district. Uh, what's kind of going on up there in them there hills? Well, <laughs> Michael, it's, it's interesting. So just to, to catch folks up, right, the 11th congressional district is the far western district in the state of North Carolina. This is a district that was represented most, most recently by Mark Meadows, who, of course, resigned his position to become chief of staff to President Trump. There's currently nobody holding the seat. So we had this fascinating um, primary. It was the third largest primary field in the entire country. So everybody and their brother was running for the 11th. Um, a guy named Mo Davis is the Democratic nominee. He came out of that cleanly. Um, and somebody named Linda Bennett, who was Mark Meadows' endorsee, who was also then endorsed by President Trump, won the first primary. But wait, it's the South, so we don't necessarily take the first primary winner. We actually went to a runoff for a second primary in North Carolina election terms, and a guy named Madison Cawthorn won, who had finished second in the, uh, in the initial primary, right? So Madison, Madison Cawthorn at the time was 24 years old. He turned 25 just a couple of weeks ago. Happy birthday to, um, to, to Madison Cawthorn. And um, so he's running against Davis. We've got this general election, redrawn lines, a district that certainly leans Republican, um, but less so than it used to. Then we got this big news this week that Cawthorn, who's been a bit of a media darling, um, particularly on the right, people have called him um, the Republican AOC, or sometimes the, the East Coast Dan Crenshaw. Um, uh, he had an Instagram post that he had posted a few years ago from um, uh, Hitler's vacation home, Eagle's Nest, and there was a little screen cap of it. And uh, he referred to Hitler as the Fuhrer. Um, and then at the end, he did say something about, but this is where supreme evil lived. And so folks on the left, of course, picked up on this and says, hey, Hitler's vacation home should not be on your, your bucket list at all. Um, yeah. Cawthorn then popped back and said, hey, but I called him a supreme evil. Then there was a lot of speculation about some other, I'll just call them tea leaves that, that folks are trying to, to read. Um, his business name is SPQR, which has been is a term appropriated by some white supremacist groups. Um, he's pictured oftentimes instead of this boring bunch of books behind me, he might have the Betsy Rog Ross flag behind him. Some people say that doesn't really mean anything. That means he likes this flag. Other people say this too has been appropriated by, by right wing causes. And then he was also quoted in a Blue Ridge public radio interview about Asheville reparations uh, said something to the effect of if you're a white liberal and you're listening to this, then you are a racist. So you put all this together, right? National uh, media attention, clearly newsworthy events, and we've had a bit of a um, kind of explosion in this North Carolina 11th congressional district race. Susan, you, you teach campaign strategies uh, as a class. What's your reaction to this? I mean, is this a unforced error? Is it self-inflicted bad news? What What's going on? How would you look at this? Well, and I, I think as Chris uh, mentioned it at the beginning, if it looks too good to be true, it probably isn't. And I think that uh, the image that he put forth um, was so, you know, not wholesome, but it was such a contrast and it was so different for the Republicans. This was a self-inflicted wound, but there was no contrition. He stretched it out. He made it worse. It's like, if you have children, you say, just tell me the truth. And then there's more forgiveness. But um, I think it's something that he make it, he 
probably will get elected, but he won't recover as the kind of uh, Republican darling that I think he was. And I think that um, Mark Meadows, that wasn't his endorsement in the first place, but I think you initially show uh, the contrition, do damage control. As far as it seems to me, he has done no damage control. Okay. Whitney, any, any thoughts about? Well, he, uh, he is, for a long time, he also had 88 people that he followed on Twitter, which 88 is another um, wink, wink, nudge, nudge at white supremacists. Um, the, you know, the, the corners of the internet where they pretend whenever you point it out that you're the ridiculous one, but you know, you know, kind of like when people do the white power symbol, um, this right. is white power now. You know, and they're like, no, we're just doing okay. Like I'm dumb and I don't study terrorism and right wing movements. Um, and so there was a lot of that with Madison Cawthorn, kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And I, I don't want to say that he actually is a white supremacist, but I do think that he was winking at them. Um, and so, and maybe it was to be funny. Uh, a lot of young men his age um, have picked up this internet. Uh, gone down the YouTube algorithm rabbit hole into far right-wing propaganda. Um, and so, again, I don't, I don't say that he meant it, but I think that he probably he thought it was a funny way of connecting with some people. And if you get it, you get it, you know, kind of thing. Um, but the other piece that is, to, to Susan's point about how he's not doing any damage control, besides all of that, he's been caught in several... Um, uh, yeah. Lies by omission <laughs> about his, his stated past, um, which the Jezebel article um, that was recently published outlines very nicely, not least of which he makes it sound like he went to the Naval Academy. He did not get in. Um, he makes it sound like he's a real estate investor. He's done like one whole purchase. And so the kind of, it's not just the white supremacy thing. It's also these other um, smaller things that overall lead up to a view of somebody who hasn't been well vetted. Um, and that could be potentially why Mark Meadows didn't choose him as, you know, his designee. Uh, but since the, since the district leans Republican, you know, um, he, he seems like the likely winner, but this kind, these kinds of little missteps in this kind of atmosphere in an election, where you have a lot of people really jazzed to vote Trump out, um, could mean that the 11th goes differently than we think. Chris, what's, what's been, I mean, it's, it's only been a couple of days, so maybe we need, you know, a little bit more time to, to really see the fallout from it. Any sense early on on the ground what the, what the reaction is in the district? You know, I mean, I think in Asheville, it has certainly made big waves. So Asheville is, um, Buncombe County, uh, which, which houses Asheville, is by far, it's this bright blue dot in the middle of, of a sea of red with a little purple. Um, and so I think it's made a splash in Buncombe County. Mo Davis is going to need more than Buncombe County, however, to win this yeah. election. No matter how much he can increase turnout in Buncombe, he's going to need to sway a lot of folks in Jackson County and some of these other farther western counties. So... I think it matters. I think it is going to be very interesting to see what happens going forward. I think he's tried to use this as a bit of a rallying cry. Um, so uh, kind of to Susan's point on, on campaign strategy, he said essentially the, the fake news media is making this, is making him out out of a molehill, right? I said he's a supreme evil. I didn't say really good things about him. And then he posted um, uh, kind of ally troops at that spot laughing and saying, look, this is what I was celebrating was us overtaking evil. He then followed, as Whitney pointed out, followed more people on Twitter um, right after this, no longer having the 88. So, and then has really kind of punched back pretty hard and said, this is um, uh, the, the fake news media making a mountain out of a molehill. So we'll see what the voters say. Um, we've got a couple of polls that are sort of leaked polls from the DCCC, but you can't it's hard to see the really what the results of, of those polls. So it's not like the Meredith poll where you can say, hey, well, let's look at the cross tabs. Let's understand what they did to see how much we can trust these. Those showed the race with Cawthorn with about a five percentage point advantage about the extent of the margin of error before all this happened. Okay. So put all that together. It's still early. 
it's Cawthorns to lose, but he did himself no favors. And frankly, I'm surprised they let the Instagram post stay. It seems like that would have been an early thing you would do would be to clean up social media. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Well, we'll, we'll check back in uh, in a couple of weeks and see you know, how the conventions play out. We'll get into the unofficial official start of the campaign season with Labor Day, and we'll work our way towards November 3rd. I want to thank again, Chris, Susan, and Whitney, and thank you for watching as well, and hope you are registered to vote, and if you choose to do so, get your absentee by mail ballot here in North Carolina, or if your state allows it, in that particular state as well, and we'll see you soon both on oldnorthstatepolitics.com blog and back here again for our next blog. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.